You may be seated. And our sermon title this morning is Boundless Grace, Boundless Grace, and we are in part three of this sermon series that we've been working through in John chapter four. And as we come now to the end of this passage and the conversation of our Lord Jesus Christ with the woman at the well, I, I feel in some senses like we're, we're sort of leaving an old friend. You know, I've gotten to know this woman at the well in Samaria uh, through studying this passage. We've seen much about the Lord Jesus Christ and the awesome grace of God is that we can come back to this passage time and time again in our Bibles and remember the truths that we've learned here. But we look at this passage and all that the Lord has done, all the Lord continues to do uh, in grace toward us is just an awesome thought. And I'm reminded in looking at John chapter 4 of the time that we spent in John chapter 3 when we came to verse 16 and the Bible read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The conversation with this woman in Samaria is an outworking of the glorious truth of that verse. God so loved the world. This is an example of the boundless love of God towards sinners. And it is demonstrated in the boundless grace of God shown to this Samaritan woman. Contrast that love of God. Contrast the grace of God in Christ with the way that the world typically practices love. His love... The love of God is truly unconditional because its, its recipients, its objects are totally depraved. It has to be unconditional. Consider the love of God that it is indiscriminate and all-encompassing. And it must be because we were enemies of God, alienated from God by wicked works. And we needed a salvation from that. When we were completely undeserving. And God's love transcends all boundaries, all boundaries of race, race, all boundaries of ethnicity, all boundaries of gender, background, religious tradition. And it transcends the greatest of boundaries, supposedly. The greatest of boundaries is our sin and our rebellion against God. And it took the cost of God's own dear son to redeem us from our sin. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I think about for the moment the definition of grace. We see the love of God toward us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Think about the definition of, of grace. Grace is the undeserved, unmerited favor of God, the favor or love of God. The blessing or favor of God's love freely given. In other words, not a favor or love, not blessings that come as a result of some claim that you have. It doesn't come because, you know, I'm a sinner, that's just what I do. God's a forgiver, that's just what he does. That's not the favor, the grace of God. That's a presumptuous faith, a presumptuous claim on God's grace. It doesn't come to you in the form of a reward because of something that you've done. If you're thinking you're a good, you think you're a good person and somehow God is going to reward you with grace, then it's not grace. If you think that you're a good person, you'll stand before God one day and somehow your good works are going to outweigh your bad works, that's not grace from God, that's debt from God. He, you think he owes you something. That's not God's grace. You don't get grace because of your circumstances. Grace is all of grace. It is unmerited, undeserved favor. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is demonstrated in that though he was rich, for your sakes, he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might become rich. And that's grace. It's not that we, that we deserved it, not because of something you did. Did you do something to earn your salvation? No. If you think you did, then it's not grace any longer. It's a reward, it's something owed, it is debt. Here, the grace that we're talking about is the undeserved work of God in the heart of sinful man. And what is that work? It's the forgiveness of sins. It's deliverance from God's wrath. It is mercy and love. Listen, God's grace is predestination. God's grace is election, is calling, is regeneration, is pardon, is justification, is adoption, is the giving of the Spirit of God. 
is sanctification, and eventually it's glorification. It is eventually heaven, and it is all of God's grace, God's grace alone. God's grace is the complete provision that God made in the Lord Jesus Christ for the complete salvation of wicked sinners like me and you. And the living embodiment of that grace, the living embodiment of that grace is the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul had Christ in mind when he wrote Titus, wrote to Titus in chapter 2, verse 11, where Paul said to Titus, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Who was it that appeared to all men? The Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the grace of God that brings salvation. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of grace of God. And the boundless nature of that grace is exhibited in his conversation with this Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. Think about it and just meditate on it for a minute. God's grace is boundless. God's grace in Christ has no boundaries, no limits, no conditions. God's grace shows no partiality. God is no respecter of persons. Doesn't matter where you're from. Doesn't matter what family you belong to. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter who you are. You were dead in trespasses. You were alienated, enemies in your mind by your wicked works. And it was all of grace, if you're in Christ, that the Lord saved you. It was all of grace because you have nothing to merit yourself before God. And if you're in Christ, that grace was lavished on you in him. The fact that it cost God his own son to redeem you. And think about it. If God gave everything, including his own son to redeem you, then the Bible is true, isn't it? When the Bible says, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? There's grace for life. There's grace for redemption. And then there's grace to live the Christian life. There's grace that will preserve you to the end. And there's grace that will take you to heaven. Just trust in him and trust yourself to him. This is the boundless grace of God. As we came to John chapter four and we looked at the boundless grace of God displayed in this conversation between the Lord Jesus Christ and this woman at the well, we first saw God's grace, God's boundless grace revealed in God's providence toward us in verses one through six. In one through six, we see the amazing providence of God at work to bring about the divine appointment at the well here in Sychar, where we see a Samaritan woman who first met her Savior. But secondly, we saw the boundless grace revealed in the evangelism of the Lord Jesus Christ and how in great compassion in verses seven through nine, Jesus wearied himself, tired himself, getting to this well in Samaria, this well in Sychar, where he could graciously entreat this Samaritan, this scandalous, immoral Samaritan woman with the gospel of grace. Then we see point three, boundless grace revealed in its ultimate expression in verses 10 through 15. That ultimate expression of the grace of God that was bestowed on ungodly sinners is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate expression of God's grace. All of the grace that you and I have experienced, all of the grace that God bestows, all points to and finds its ultimate fulfillment in Christ. And fourthly, We saw the boundless grace of God revealed in the reality of our sin in verses 16 through 19. As we see the Lord Jesus Christ expose the sin of the Samaritan woman in verses 16 through 19, as we consider the depths of our own sin and rebellion against God, as we do that, we can more clearly see and clearly understand the scope and extent of God's grace toward us. The reality of our sin reveals the boundless nature of God's grace. You want to understand grace, begin by understanding your sinfulness and then look at all that God has offered you in Christ. We want to understand grace and the love of God. You need to cultivate an appreciation for your own depravity. When we see clearly our own sin, we can more appreciate the grace of God in Christ. That's the way it works. It's the idea, if you will, behind Paul's statement in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, where Paul says, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. That's the idea. When you understand sin, when you come face to face with the law of God and you see the depravity of your own heart, grace abounds, doesn't it? 
When you understand the depths of your wickedness and that the Lord Jesus Christ offers you freely living water and everlasting life, despite the wickedness of your sin, that is awesome, boundless, wonder-working grace. Amen? And we need to consider our sin, and where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Think about what grace brings about in the heart then of the believer. What is the counterpart of grace in the heart of a genuine Christian? It's gratefulness, isn't it? Gratefulness to God for that grace. It's love. It's love for God for all that he's done for us in Christ. Love for his boundless grace. And doesn't gratefulness in your heart and love in your heart for Christ produce faith? Bear the fruits of faith. You trust the Lord. You trust him with your soul, right? And that faith produces devotion, gratefulness, love, faith, devotion. You see grace and its fruits. We love him because he what? First loved us. And when he first loved us, the fruit of that love toward us was love, gratefulness, faith, devotion for him. We love him because he first loved us. Sometimes when you get in your Christian life and you examine yourself, you find yourself in sin, you find yourself in apathy, in indifference, find yourself in difficulty, find yourself in, tr- in struggle. What is it in the power of the Spirit that will wrench you from that wicked condition, that wicked state? It's the grace of God in Christ and then the gratefulness that produces in your heart and the love for Christ, the affection for Christ uh, in your heart and then the devotion and the faith that births in you. It's all of grace. John says in chapter 14, verse 24, that he who does not love me does not keep my words. If you struggle in your sin, it means one of two things. It means one, you're not saved, or maybe saved, but you're not loving Christ enough. We want to cultivate love and devotion in your heart toward Christ. Cultivate a deeper understanding of of your disgusting wickedness and a greater appreciation for his boundless grace. All of this, as we think about the love of God, the grace of God in Christ toward us, all of this in very embryonic form is beginning to take shape now in the Samaritan woman's mind as she talks with Jesus at the well at Sychar. Very embryonic form, and it's very beginning stages, now beginning to take shape as she considers what's happening. She's been confronted by the compassion, by the love of this stranger that would talk with her, a Samaritan woman. Uh, She's willing now to forego the the stigma of who she is to talk to him. He's willing to forgive or forego the stigma of who she is to talk to her. And in great compassion, he begins to talk to her about spiritual things living water and everlasting life. At the same time, now think about the circumstances here, at the same time that he miraculously demonstrates his omniscience by telling her everything about herself, at the same time he demonstrates his ability to see right through her and to see everything about her, she feels the conviction and the shame and the guilt of her sin. And it has to be that way. Feeling the shame and the conviction and guilt of sin will bring her face to face with the grace of God in Christ. She recognizes Jesus now as the one who has come from God. In verse 19, she says he's a prophet. And she recognizes Jesus as a prophet of God and omniscient. At the same time, she recognizes herself as a sinner. And it brings conviction and shame. If you remember the story of Peter, right? Peter in the boat on the lake of Gennesaret where they had been toiling all night trying to get a catch of fish and they could catch nothing, right? The Lord Jesus comes along. The Lord Jesus is in the boat, tells Peter to cast his net on the other side. And in miraculous power, the Lord Jesus Christ reveals himself in that catch of fish. It's a miracle. And how does Peter respond? Peter falls at Jesus' knees and says, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. You know, in, in the Lord's presence, We become, we should be convicted over our sin. Face to face with a holy God, we should feel the shame and guilt of our sin. Think about the vision of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. The Lord is high and lifted up. He's on his throne. The the train of his robe fills the temple. 
And Isaiah cries out, woe is me, I'm undone. We come face to face with the Lord of glory. It should bring you face to face with your own sin. I'm an unclean, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. Here, the woman at the well, she's coming face to face with the Lord. This is a prophet of God. And he has exposed me in my sin. And she's feeling shame, as she should. She's feeling conviction, as she should. And she's feeling the guilt of her sin. Oftentimes, even for the Christian, right? It's possible for us to fall into a wicked pattern where we just don't feel conviction over our sin as we should. We don't see our sin for the evil that it is. And we don't see the Lord for the holy God that he is. And we don't see Christ for the gracious Savior that he is. And we leave, live defeated lives, right? Defeated Christian lives in sin. Cultivate an understanding from the word of God of your own sinfulness. Grow an appreciation for the love and mercy of God in Christ. And let that love and gratefulness and devotion well up in your hearts for him. I can imagine, you know, the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, as Jesus Christ is exposing her sin, dropping her head, eyes welling up with tears, and in her mind thinking, what have I done? You know, what have I done? She says in verse 19, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. That word there for perceive in the original language is a word that means I've come to realize. It means I've come to understand. Short conversation, right? Seems like a short conversation. And yet, in this span of time, certainly the Spirit of God at work on her heart, the Spirit of God exposing sin, the Spirit of God enlightening her understanding, open her blind, opening her blind eyes, opening her deaf ears, bringing her from death to life. And in that time, coming to perceive, coming to understand, coming to realize that this man is from God, coming to realize at the same time her own sin. She needed grace, right? She needed pardon. She needed forgiveness. She needed to be made whole. She needed to be cleansed. She needed to be right with God. If not, she would have died and gone to hell, spend an eternity paying off her own sins. She needed grace. She needed acceptance with God. And I tell you, if you're here today and you're not in Christ, you need grace. You need to be cleansed. You need to be pardoned. You need to be forgiven. You need to be, you need to be washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. You need acceptance with God. You need right standing with God. If you're to die today, if you're to leave here, get hit by a car. Leave here and get cancer. There's just so many ways, right, that the Lord can take you out. And you'll stand before him in your own filthy rags. You need grace. You need the grace of God in Christ. According to verse 10, according to verse 10, all she needed to do was ask for it. If you would have asked me, I would have given you fountains of living water. All she needed to do was ask. That's all that you need to do. That's all that you need to do. Ask the Lord and he freely gives. You ask in faith. You ask believing. And the gift of living water is yours. Jesus Christ here, as she's considering him in this conversation, wasn't just a prophet in her eyes. He was a Jewish prophet. And that raises all kinds of other complications here. The realization of that, the realization that he was a Jewish prophet and she is a Samaritan woman is now more overbearing for her than ever. She's considering at this point, it's not just what I've done, but it's who I am. She's been convicted over her sin. She is a serial adulteress. She's an immoral woman. And yet now it's not just as much what she's done 
as it is who she is by nature. She's a Samaritan. She's been convicted over her sin. She senses the shame and guilt of it. She wants forgiveness and she's talking to a prophet of God. But now who she is in her mind is standing in the way of that forgiveness. So she brings this problem back up in a sense by the statement that she makes in verse 20. She says, our fathers, the Samaritans, worshiped on this mountain. You Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Now she had brought this issue up in verse nine. It was in a much different context, a different place in the conversation. She's humbled now. She's been humbled and she needs to know what to do. The Samaritans worshiped on Mount Gerizim. Wrongly, I might add. They had built a foreign altar on Mount Gerizim, but most importantly to her at this point, all that she knew was that if she wanted forgiveness, she would go to Mount Gerizim to get it, to receive forgiveness for her sins. So she's been humbled by conviction over her sin, and she's in her mind right now, where do I go to get forgiveness? It's in the response of Jesus Christ to that statement in verse 20 that we see point five on our notes. We see the boundless grace of God revealed in its scope, in its scope. And we see that in verses 20 through 24. Verse 20, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. You Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where, our, where one ought to worship. And so this Samaritan woman being under conviction for her sin, the great divide between Jews and Samaritans has never been more important to her than it was right at this moment. Now think about it for a moment. She's concerned about who she is. The great divide between Jews and Samaritans, foremost in her mind as she makes this statement and as Jesus now responds, Think about yourself, myself, in that context. In coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, the great divide that stands between you and God is your sin. In the same way that this is priority number one in her mind, that needs to be priority number one in your mind today. There is a great divide between you, a wicked sinner, and a holy God, and that divide, don't you want it to be crossed? Don't you want it to be brought together? Don't you want to be made right? She's thinking in her mind, how can you, a Jewish prophet, offer me the gift of living water when I am a scandalous, Samaritan, immoral woman even worshiping in the wrong place? How can the Lord forgive you, a wicked sinner, a liar, a fornicator, a homosexual, an adulterer, a coward, unforgiving, unmerciful, right? Disobedient to parents, as the Bible says. How can the Lord forgive you? This Samaritan woman wanted that gift. She wants what Christ is talking about. But in her mind, she's like, do you even understand who I am? As, he's ta as she's talking to Jesus, the, the mountain, Mount Gerizim, is in full view of that well there. And her heart is in full view of the Savior. He sees everything about her in the same way that he sees everything about you. He knows who you are. Just like he knew who this woman at the well was. He knows you. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. And this is a statement of emphasis. It's a statement of authority. Believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Jesus is saying here in verse 21 that a breakthrough is coming. There's a new reality. The hour is coming when you're not going to be concerned with choosing between cult locations to worship. You're not going to be concerned with the place of your worship. You're going to be concerned with the who of your worship, right? Worship is not about external ritual. It's not about where you go. It's got to be from the heart. The statement here in verse 21 meant for her personally because Jesus says directly to her, woman, believe me. But it's important to note that as Jesus moves into the next phrase, he uses the plural for you. The hour is coming when you, plural, will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship. Who's he, who's he talking about there? Moves from the singular woman to the plural you. He's talking about the woman but he's talking about all those Samaritans that will believe on him after her. He's talking about all those Gentiles, all those Gentiles down through the ages because of the grace of God in Christ would be brought into the people of God through faith in him. He's talking to you and I. He's talking to you and I. 
The hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship. The breakthrough wasn't only going to affect her personally, it's going to affect all the world in all locations, every tribe, tongue, and nation. Verse 22, Christ says, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Now the Samaritans only recognized, again, the first five books of the Bible. They only had the first five books of the Bible. So they worshiped in ignorance because they did not have the full revelation of God at that time. They worshiped in ignorance. She worshiped what she did not know. They didn't know God because they didn't have the fullest, fullest revelation of who he is. And because of the revelation entrusted to the Jews, the complete revelation of God, salvation is of the Jews. God gave them the oracles of God, as Paul says in Romans. They worshiped in that sense, they worshiped in truth because they had the full revelation of God that had been given to them. Verse 23, Christ says, the hour is coming and now is. He takes what is future and makes it a present reality. The hour is coming and yep, it's, come, it's right now and now is. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. Verse 24, God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. However right the Jews may have believed themselves to be in their dispute, in their argument with the Samaritans, there's a different set of criteria that now applies to the true worship of God. Doesn't matter who you are or where you're from doesn't matter who was previously right or previously wrong. Old distinctions of Jew, Samaritan, Gentile are going away. There will be one people of God, and that one people of God will be distinctively marked by their worship of God in spirit and in truth. Now think about it for a moment. Today, there are many people across our world, across our country, that are coming together to worship because of their race. They're marked. Their church, they're coming together by their common race. How unbiblical is that? Sunday, you've heard it said, is the most segregated day of the week. <laughs> That's not the way heaven's gonna be. I praise the Lord for the diversity in our church. Those from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. I praise the Lord for the diversity of our church considering our backgrounds, every socioeconomic level, right? Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter what family you belong to, doesn't matter your ethnicity, it doesn't matter. We're marked distinctively by a worship of the Lord Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth. And the day that we forego worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth, we forsake the right to call ourselves a church. The Lord has been gracious. Those that are the people of God are marked by their worship of God in spirit and in truth. Let's put all this in perspective, right? Point number one, think about this. The grace of God is so boundless in its scope as to extend to this Samaritan woman, no matter who she is, no matter what she's done. Now think about it. The Samaritans were the most hated, most outcast people imaginable to the Jews, I mean, worse than a Gentile. The Samaritans were outcasts, hated people. And it's like here in John chapter 4 that the Lord is just putting that before our eyes constantly. He's laying out that point to put the boundless grace of God on display. In verse 4, he must go through Samaria. In verse 5, he's coming to a city of Samaria. In verse 7, he's talking to a woman of Samaria. In verse 9, the woman of Samaria asked him a question regarding her being a Samaritan woman. It's like Samaria, 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 as if to say to us, listen, the grace of God is boundless. <laughs> there are no limits, no boundaries on the grace of God. We don't even know this lady's name, but we get all the time, right, that she's a Samaritan woman. Listen, that's not lost on her. That's not lost on her. She knows who she is and she knows what she's done. And that's a concern to her at this point in the conversation. She knows, she can't get away from the fact that she's a Samaritan woman. But God's grace in Christ towards sinners is boundless. That's an awesome thought and something we should take joy in. You may think to yourself today, I'm a divorced woman. I'm a divorced man. That's who I am. I'm divorced. God hates divorce. 
God's grace is boundless. This woman was living with a man who was not her husband. She's a serial adulterer. But God's grace is boundless. Are you a homosexual? You know a homosexual. God's grace is boundless. You've spurned God your entire life. You have done that. I've done that. Spurned God before Christ, outside of Christ. Thumbed your nose at him. Spit in his face with your rebellion. Made the cross a common thing with your sin. But God's grace is boundless. In similar fashion to the Samaritan woman, you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you are a sinner by nature. You come to grips with who you are. You are a sinner, therefore you sin. You didn't become a sinner by sinning. (laughs) God's boundless grace will extend even to you if you'll trust him and if you'll turn from that sin. Trust him, turn from your sin. Reminds me of the Ethiopian eunuch. We were walking through Acts, right? Acts chapter eight. And Philip, the evangelist, evangelizes the Ethiopian eunuch. Think about that reality for a moment. He was by nature an Ethiopian. Couldn't do anything about that, right? Can a leopard change his spots? (laughs) Nope. He was a eunuch. God in Isaiah had already pronounced a judgment against Ethiopia and had already said eunuchs weren't to be allowed in the temple. The Ethiopian eunuch couldn't even get into the outer court of the temple. And yet, based in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the boundless grace of God, God says in Isaiah, look to me and be saved all you ends of the earth. He goes on to say, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Who's that? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And because of Christ, God says in Isaiah 56, that's even to foreigners, this Ethiopian, and eunuchs in Isaiah 56 that hold fast his covenant and love his name, that he will give them an everlasting name that will never be cut off and that they will be accepted. It's the grace of God, even to Ethiopian eunuchs. Samaritan women, Ethiopian eunuchs, and sinners with wicked hearts like you and me. Boundless grace. Think about this, another point. The Samaritan woman is now humbled. She wants forgiveness because of her sin and she's asking, where do I go to get it? Where do I go to get forgiveness? She wants to repent of sin. She's looking for the right place to do it. Do you see the problem? She desperately wants to be right with God and she's concerned with what religious ritual she needs to go through and where to do that. It's not a where, it's a who. It's not a what, it's a who. False, ignorant religion. False, ignorant religion is full of do this and do that. Full of go there, go here, do this and do that. What little religious ritual do I need to perform to make me right with God? What little prayer can I say, right? Give me the words to say and I'll say them. Tell me what to say, I want to say it in just the right way. What little ritual can I perform to make me right with God? What little church can I go to where I can light a little candle, rub a little bead, you know, pray to a dead person? What do I need to do? Tell me and I'll do it so I can be right with God. Something about us, bound up in our hearts, bound up in in our flesh is this sinful, wicked need for ritual, for ceremony, for doing something that will make us right with God when there is nothing that you can do to make yourself right with God. There's only two kinds of worship in all the world. Only two kinds of worship. There is the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ from the heart in spirit and in truth. And there is all other worship, whatever that looks like. One is acceptable to God. All other is an abomination. Verse 23, 
The Lord says the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. She's going to have to humble herself and drop her false worship. She's presented with who she is. She's presented with her sin. She becomes convicted of her sin. It's not, though, just what she's done that's the problem. That is a problem. That's not the only problem. It's who she is. Who she is is a problem. She's got the Lord in his grace overcomes who she is. And now she's presented face to face with her false worship, her idolatrous worship. I grew up in church, in a lot of bad churches, being a false worshiper. But the Lord was gracious to me. Many of you grew up in false worship. There are people all over the country today worshiping God in a way that is an abomination to him. But the grace of God in Christ is boundless. She's going to have to drop her false worship. Pretty soon here, there's going to be no more temple. Pretty soon there's going to be no more priesthood, no more sacrifices, no more feast days, no more altars. Christ has come and he is doing away with all of that. Her religious world, so to speak, is going to be turned upside down. Worship has always meant, was always meant to be from the heart. Always meant to be from the heart. But our wicked hearts pervert and corrupt that. We need new hearts. We need new hearts and we need the spirit of God. We need the grace of God in our hearts to worship him in spirit and in truth. And the grace of God to that end is boundless. God seeks worshipers for himself. And if God is going to seek them, worshipers for himself, through his boundless grace, he's going to give them what they need to worship him in spirit and in truth. A heart full of love and devotion and gratefulness to God for all that he's done in Christ. A new heart that hates sin, that loves the Lord, that finds Christ precious. He's going to give us of his spirit so that by his spirit we can be empowered, enabled, have our minds, our hearts illumined and worship the Lord as he deserves to be worshiped. And isn't it just an awesome thought for this Samaritan woman, despite what she's done, despite who she is, that she, because of the spirit of God, because of the grace of God, can worship and her worship is acceptable? What a glorious blessing. We live for the purpose for which God created us, which is to be worshipers of him. God, Jesus Christ, wants worship from the heart, worship that is real, worship that is genuine. When the Bible says worship in spirit, you notice that's a little less there. It's not the Holy Spirit. We are to worship in the power of the Holy Spirit, but this is talking about worship from the heart, from the heart. And it's worship that is in accord with the truth of Scripture, the truth of Scripture. Think about it. What if many of you, before you, the Lord saved you, and you came to worship him rightly, worshiped in a church that preached a false gospel. You worshiped in a church where they were preaching a false gospel. Is that worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth? No. They're worshiping in ignorance. They're worshiping what they do not know. They don't have the gospel. It's abomination. It's abominable to God. It's not true worship. Many of you, before you came to Christ, may, you may know people now that worship a God of their own imagination right? A semblance of God, a semblance of Christ, but not God, not Christ. You know what? I'm a sinner. That's what I do. God's a forgiver. That's what he does. I'm going to live it up in my sin. Expect God to forgive me. Go to heaven when I die. Is that worship in spirit and in truth? No, that's counting the blood of the covenant, a common thing. That's worship in ignorance. And it is an abomination to God that you would presume upon the grace of God to worship him in your sin. True worshipers in spirit and truth are those who have repented of their sin, turned from their sin, and trust Christ alone to save them. It's worship that is affirmed by the Bible. Millions today, millions, millions are going to go to a worship service where the Lord Jesus Christ is called down from heaven to be a sacrifice again. And bread will be offered. A cup will be offered. Those that will believe that that's the actual body, the actual blood of the Lord, is that worship in spirit and in truth? There are many today. Millions 
across our nation, across the world, millions that will presume to worship the, the Lord by going to a church where it's acceptable to call yourself a Christian and live in sin. Is that worship in spirit and in truth? Lastly, verses 25 and 26, as so we come to the end of our conversation, we see the boundless grace of God revealed in its ultimate fulfillment. The Lord standing before this woman at the well. So Lord Jesus Christ has come. The ultimate fulfillment of the boundless grace of God is the incarnate Lord of glory. Verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who's called Christ. When he comes, he's gonna tell us all things. Verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. It's awesome. When you just think about being there, you know, and the Lord Jesus Christ standing in front of you. Even with only the first five books of the Bible, the Samaritans believed that a Messiah was coming. From Genesis, Genesis chapter three, we see the first promise of the gospel. In Deuteronomy 18, there's a promise of a prophet like Moses who would come. So the Samaritans, even in the first five books, believed that the Messiah would come. Now here, this humble woman, she's been humbled. She's been convicted, shamed. She feels the guilt and weight of her sin. She's been humbled by exposure to her sin by the Lord Jesus Christ. And she's just been told to worship from the heart in accord with truth. And now she wants to know what that truth is. She wants full disclosure. She's saying now, basically, give me the truth. You know, when the Messiah comes, we're gonna have all truth. Messiah is gonna give us all the truth. We'll know the truth at that time when he comes. What an awesome statement from the Lord in verse 26. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am. That's interesting here. There's no he there in the original language. The original language is I who speak to you am. It's the covenant name of God. It's the way God has referred to himself. This is one of the profound I am statements that we'll see, we'll encounter through the gospel of John. Seven of them that we'll study in particular that are all profound statements of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is saying, basically, the one speaking to you now, I who stand before you am. <laughs> God incarn incarnate, the Lord of glory. With this statement, you know, Jesus has spent the conversation revealing herself to her, right? And here, in his omniscience, we've already seen, and in this statement, reveals himself now to her. That's the way evangelism is done. It's a great example of evangelism from the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to see our wickedness. We need to see our sinfulness. When you're sharing the gospel with somebody, you, in order to share the gospel, you've got to present them as who they are. Uh, take them through the law of God. Let them be crushed against that rock. Expose their false worship and then reveal the boundless grace of God in Christ. You know, this goes hand in hand with John's purpose for writing the gospel. Uh, the purpose for writing, John says, is that so that you may believe that he is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. This, uh, start to finish, John chapter four, this conversation, it's a miraculous work of the Lord, isn't it? It's a miracle. Uh, the Lord in his omniscience, the Lord in his grace, the providence of God, everything that we've seen is miraculous. And this woman, this scandalous, immoral, Samaritan woman got saved that day. Lord opened her eyes, brought her to himself. One indication that that's true is verse 39. Look at verse 39. Many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. Believing this Samaritan woman went away as a witness for Christ. As a witness for Christ. She turned from her sin she trusted Christ alone. She bore witness of her Savior. That's what genuine disciples of Christ do. As a result of her believing and her witness, you have many Samaritans in that village who were saved. Many Samaritans who were saved in the gospel freely offered to Gentiles. They could come to faith in Christ and be forgiven of their sin. 
Think about our evangelism today. When you go to, in the example of this Samaritan woman and in the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you go and witness, you're responsible, right, to bring the law of God, expose someone in their sin, lovingly caring with compassion, to expose sin to them, to expose their false worship, and to take them by the hand and lead them to the Savior. And when you do that, it's no less of a miracle, no less of a miracle. Lord Jesus Christ promises you, lo, I'm with you even to the end of the age, that the Lord does that work of opening blind eyes, opening deaf ears, breaking hard, brittle hearts, and saving souls for his worship. It's a miracle. I mean, it is a miracle. The Holy Spirit stands ready to do that work for his own. Uh, we've just got to be faithful, right, to do that work. So we said when we started that that Samaritan woman in Sychar that day went to the well and found much more than she expected to find. In fact, she was found, right? But you, if you're here today and you're a Christian, and you're going to live the Christian life, you're, gonna go, you're to go to that same well, day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. Christians sin. Praise the Lord, he's given us a new heart. Praise the Lord, he's indwelt us with his spirit. Praise the Lord that the power of sin and the life of a believer has been broken so that you can live for him. But Christians sin. When you Christians sin, you go to the same well. You go to the same well. It's the boundless grace of God in Christ that we as the redeemed people of God have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that we can in our guilt. Is it right that you feel guilt when you sin? Yes, it's right that you're guilty when you sin, but is it that guilt that motivates us to live for Christ? It should never be that way. That guilt that you feel over sin should drive you to the, to the well, should drive you to the grace of God in Christ to be forgiven. And that grace, that boundless grace, just should well up in you a fountain of living water, a fountain of gratefulness, a fountain of love for the Lord. And that grace of God, that gratefulness, that love should motivate you to live fervently for him and persevere to the end until you're saved. It's the grace of God, boundless grace. It's the grace of God that sanctifies. It is the grace of God that one day will glorify. Amen? Amen, let's pray. Father in heaven, God, thank you for grace. We praise you, God, that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. I pray, God, that you'd find us faithful to live fervently for Christ, that we would abandon our sin, that we would trust in him alone and go to the well, the deep, infinite, boundless well of grace. It's just an amazing thought, God, that you've redeemed us. Now, how much more also will you freely give us all things? Thank you, God, that you preserve us. Help us, Lord, not to fall into the ignorant trap of depending upon ourselves, depending upon our own strength, depending upon our own willpower. God, but find us faithful to run to the well for grace. We love you and praise you in these things, God. I thank you for Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.